kena maunga wakahi, kena wai toku kiri, kena matawaka o te motu, kanui te mihi. Tēnā kotu ka, ka, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Park Webster, taku engoa. Welcome everybody, and I'm really pleased to welcome everyone here tonight to hear Peter Crampton um, talking about health. Um, a couple of years ago, when um, the Labour government instituted a review of our public health system, which in general is a very good health system, um, but is subject to increasing demands and shrinking resources, and it has been for a number of years. Um, they um, set up a review of the health and disability system uh, to make it more sustainable, to produce bit more equitable outcomes for all New Zealanders, and to shift the balance of treatment of, from away from treatment of illness to health and well-being. The, the review, um, when it came out, proposed that Health New Zealand be set up, um, reporting to the Ministry of Health, health boards be reduced in number and all appointed, and effective treaty partnerships be established, as well as better integration of planning and a 20-year health plan. Um, this was only thought to be possible if we had a structural and accountability change, planning framework changes, government and performance changes, and enhancement of rangatiratanga and embedding of mata ranga Maori. When Andrew Little, who was the Minister of Health who received the report, um, got it, he subsequently announced many changes that were in the report, but also um, a single health system. And the changes are to be made over the next 12 to 24 months, which is a major um, exercise. So we decided tonight, with all of that happening and all of these things underway, um, and we haven't had a look at the health system for quite a long time, um, that we would ask one of the panellists on the review team, um, Professor Peter Crampton from um, Otago University. He's in the Kohatu Centre for um, Haora Maori uh, at university, but he's also been the Pro Vice Chancellor of Health um, Sciences and the Dean of the Medical School. Um, his research is very wide, but it includes, um, apart from uh, social indicators and epidemiology, includes healthcare policy and funding and Maori health. So with that background um, and his involvement in the committee, um, we thought it would be really good to get him to talk to us about what happened during you know, with the committee reports and how it came out, and also to talk to us about um, the subsequent announcements by the government and how he sees them um, working out in the near future. So Peter, I'd like to hand over to you, please, and ask you to make your presentation. Thank you. Oh, kia ora, Pat. Thank you so very much. Welcome everybody and thank you so very much for uh, taking the trouble on your Tuesday evening to join this session. Uh, my name is Peter Crampton, as Pat said. Um, <clears throat> I work in Kohatu. Uh, the Centre for Holder Māori at the University of Otago, based in Dunedin. And uh, I bring to this discussion a number of uh, perspectives. Uh, so I started life, uh, professional life, as a general practitioner in Porirua. And I see on the list of names in front of me, uh, two or three people who were also involved at that time. I see Peter Glensel's name and I see John Ra's name. Um, <clears throat> following a number of years in, in Cannons Creek, uh, I moved on to studying public health and, and did public health training in the University of Otago and have spent the, the, the balance of the last 30 years working in academic public health in a university setting. Uh, generally very closely linked into the, into the policy world. Um, and have had a number of hats uh, during that time. Uh, and always throughout the past 30 years, uh, strong engagement with Te Ao Māori. So I bring a, uh, that sort of background with me uh, into this discussion. And I think judging from the names I see in front of me on the screen, 
there's a great deal of uh, expertise uh, in this virtual room. Uh, and so I would hugely welcome when the time comes hearing your perspectives and uh, questions and thoughts and reflections on the uh, truly momentous changes which are happening right now. So thank you again for, for joining this evening. So I'm gonna share a screen now. Pat, you can just give me the thumbs up when that is visible to you. And that should be visible now. Yep. Cool, That's okay. Um, now Pat, just in terms of your format, you said to me that uh, I can chatter away for 30 to 40, 45 minutes, something like that. Yep. And then we will have time for discussion and questions. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yep. Great. Okay. I mean, just for the record, Pat, I'm delighted if people interrupt or want to ask questions on the way through. I mean, I enjoy that. So um, yep. don't, I mean, if people have got burning questions, please don't hold back. Just uh, here, I'm taking over Pat's uh, sort of purpose. No, can I suggest that because we've not done it live questions, um, that we actually have chat until you've finished. So people can put things on chat if um, they want to make any comments and then we'll do the questions at the end. But we'll open that up for people to ask and talk about things then. But we're not really 100. This is our second time doing it on Zoom like this. Yeah. OK, no, no, no that sounds fine then. So let's stick to that, that protocol. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to um, romp our way through some material here, um, mainly focusing on the current health reforms, but I wish to put that in a context. I, I generally put this slide up just to indicate that I wear various hats and bring different perspectives. Other than my employment, I'm the um, deputy chair of the Southern District Health Board, a, a recent appointee to that role. Uh, I'm a, a board member of the Health Quality and Safety Commission. Um, I have been involved with uh, various aspects of uh, Waitangi Tribunal claims around Holder or Māori. Um, I'm a member of the Royal New Zealand College of General Practitioners uh, and the equivalent College of Public Health Medicine. And my, whoops, my wife, Alison, is a, um, a, a barrister who works in health law, uh, human rights, mental health, etc. And she also is a deputy chair of the Health Practitioners Disciplinary Tribunal. All right, <clears throat> uh, none of what I'm saying today uh, comes out of my head in particular. It's the work of many people and has been contributed to many people, both uh, going back in the past and, and uh, in the present. Um, <clears throat> particularly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my colleagues in Kohatu who enrich my thinking and challenge me and keep me on my toes every day of my working life. Uh, those uh, people in the photograph there on the bottom left are the members of the Health and Disability System Review Panel. So I acknowledge and thank them for their tremendous work. The chair of the panel is the uh, blondish woman at the back there, Heather Simpson. And uh, on the right hand side there um, are the names of the panel members. Uh, and also in the middle, the names of the Māori Expert Advisory Group shared, chaired by Sharon Shea, uh, who worked alongside the panel in devising the recommendations that we made. And I also want to acknowledge the work of the Secretariat, which got up to about 20 people, I think, at its busiest. So a lot of acknowledgements there and, and many, many others are, are warranted as well. So here is a little outline of what I might uh, cover in the next uh, 30, 40 minutes or so. I want to place these current changes in context. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the health reforms of the last 30 years, because it's been a time of health reforms. And then uh, quickly touch on the timeline for the current changes that Pat touched on herself. <clears throat> talk about the central architecture of the new system localities, and that's the language that we're using now, and locality planning, the public health structures, uh, which could not be more relevant in a time of a pandemic, and, and then finish with uh, 
so, uh, reference to the new Tiriti or Waitangi principles embedded in the health system and the role of the iwi Māori relationship boards uh, and uh, then concluding some, with some reflections. So that's the, the plan. So let's get going with that. <clears throat> All right, on one slide, we're covering a great deal of history here. Uh, looking at the names on the screen, Pat, I think that uh, I don't need to be talking too much about the 1938 Social Security Act. First Labour government elected in 1935, <clears throat> enacted the Social Security Act, and in so doing, established uh, the welfare state. And as part of that, the health system, the public health system. Uh, now, <clears throat> I have a general knowledge question here, and uh, I'd be interested to know later if anybody knows the answer to this. To the best of my knowledge, the first organized public, let's, let's call it a public health system, even though that word's a bit loose in, in the way I'm using it right now, in the world, in a, in a, at least in the, the Western world, was which country? So I'll just give you three seconds to think about that. Make a note of your answer, and we'll come back to that later on. It was not, to the best of my knowledge, New Zealand. <clears throat> uh, and in fact, uh, it was the first national health system, which can be described as such, was set up in the 1890s. in uh, Bismarck in Germany. To the best of my knowledge, and again, I'm waiting for someone to tell me I'm wrong about this. I think New Zealand probably set up the second properly organized national health system in 1938, um, straight after the Great Depression, of course. And, and then in 1948, the National Health Service in the UK was established. <coughs> Uh, both the New Zealand Health System and, the, U and the, uh, the National Health Service in the UK were established after periods of considerable social turmoil and distress. The Great Depression in the case in New Zealand and, of course, World War II in um, the UK. <clears throat> and, and I think one might argue that in both instances there were moments of national cohesion and national unity, which is not normal in, in uh, capitalist Anglophone countries around the globe. Generally, we're not particularly unified in, our, in, in a social solidarity sense. And uh, Labour governments in both those countries, both New Zealand and the UK, and then in England, took advantage of moments of national solidarity to um, enact very, very uh, uh, significant pieces of legislation. <clears throat> Since 1938, the system has grown and developed largely in an ad hoc way, I would say, sometimes in a planned way. And by the time of the 1980s, politicians were wanting to review and reform aspects of the system starting in the 1980s with the commencement of the establishment of the district health boards, um, a foreshadowing of moves to integrate funding of primary and secondary care, and a number of other developments, many of which came to fruition in the, in the subsequent 10 to 20 years. The most radical of those changes were the 1993 health system changes along the lines of quasi markets. Uh, that was Simon Upton, Minister of Health at that time. <clears throat> he also was the Minister in Charge of Science and reformed the science sector. Most of the changes of 1993 legislation did not survive. The purchase of provider split aspects of that have survived. Pharmac has survived. And a profound change occurred in primary health care, whereby general practitioners who had been largely up to that point uh, unaccountable for the very large responsibilities they, they held and also for the very large amount of public resource they um, 
were responsible for administering, uh, they were unaccountable to the state for those uh, responsibilities. And following 1993, contracting was introduced for all general practitioners. And that was a profound change. And that has also stayed with us since then. So a number of those changes did stick. Many of them did not. In the year 2001, there was new legislation uh, enacted by the then Labour government <clears throat> setting up 21 district health boards. 21 subsequently became 20, which is what we have now, uh, with the merger of uh, Otago and Southland into Southern District Health Board. And I'm on the board of that particular board. <clears throat> and we have had a, a 20, nearly a 20 year period of relative calm and stability in the health system. One might say neglect, but nevertheless, no major reforms or restructurings during the last 20 years. And, and given the, the experience that we'd had in the 20 years prior to that, uh, it's, I think for many, has been a, a time of welcome calm. Nevertheless, uh, uh, increasing disquiet and a sense of the system not working the way that we wish it to work. There had been a number of reviews and uh, some partial restructurings of aspects of the system during that time, but relatively low key and small in scale. Um, the Waitangi Tribunal report, Haora report, released in halfway through 2019, is downloadable from, uh, if you Google Haora report from the Waitangi Tribunal, it's a very hefty report. It's not very well, well, it's not indexed at all. The table of contents is, is helpful. It's, a, it's an extraordinary resource document, even though it's a bit unwieldy to handle. Uh, that report uh, was unstinting in its critique of the failure of our health system to deliver health outcomes for Māori. And it also posited a, a new set of principles of the Te Tiriti or Waitangi, which should be, in the view of the tribunal, embedded within the health system. We'll come back to that later, because uh, the health system has taken that on board. <clears throat> David Clark was the Minister of Health in the first term of this government, or at least the first part of the first term of this government. <clears throat> and he was very clear that he, one of his motivations in wishing to be the Minister of Health was that he believed our system has grown like topsy, uh, a lot of it in an unplanned way, and uh, that maybe now was a good time to review it from the ground up going back to first principles. And he identified a number of first principles, but in particular, he put emphasis on equity of health outcomes for Māori and for other groups and sustainability of the system at the center of his frame of reference for that review. So the so-called Simpson review was launched shortly after he announced that. And I was, as Pat said, one of the panel members of the review. And those faces in the photograph that you saw early on were the other panel members. <clears throat> now, in the event, uh, David Clark, uh, his peccadilloes, if you will, uh, around mountain biking, meant that he uh, relinquished the health portfolio towards the end of that term. And it was taken up by Chris Hipkins uh, as a, in a caretaker role. And of course, Andrew Little was appointed after the last election as the Minister of Health. And that in itself is a very interesting series of developments. And let me say at this point, as an aside, and others of you will have views on this, and I'd be fascinated to hear them, because I don't know Andrew Little personally at all myself. I suspect he's one of, if not the most, Tiriti literate Minister of Health we've ever had. And I think that he has brought an energy to this uh, restructuring that we might not have had under any other circumstances. 
in any event, he ended up being the minister who received the review's final report. Uh, that report was literally signed off on, I think, the same weekend that the first lockdown was announced last year. It all occurred simultaneously. And in fact, David Clark, who was still Minister of Health at that time, put it on hold for a number of weeks because of the preoccupation with the COVID pandemic. The report itself was written and developed uh, with no knowledge of COVID coming along, of course, or at least only in the very latter stages of the report's development. But I, I would like to think that we anticipated major public health threats and built those into our recommendations. And we'll come back to that shortly. So uh, that, that's an overview of where, a very rapid overview of uh, how we have got to where we are now. A couple of cartoons here, just going back to 1938. The then Labour government tried to socialise uh, really all aspects of healthcare. They succeeded with public hospitals. They succeeded with maternity care, with pharmaceuticals, with laboratory tests, and a whole range of other things. Uh, but the New Zealand branch of the British Medical Association, that's BMA on the horse there, uh, vehemently opposed the socialization of general practice and fought an act, a political action against the government and won. And that cartoon, of course, shows, uh, that's Peter Fraser, isn't it? Um, and uh, Michael Joseph Savage pushing the horse to water, trying to get it to drink out of the social security scheme and failing. Um, so general practice has essentially maintained a position, uh, structurally speaking, in the majority of cases in the private for-profit sector, not part of the public health system, but in receipt of public subsidies. Structurally speaking, that's similar to what's uh, the, the case in the UK, but in, the, in, in England at least, general practice is much more hybridized into the system than it is here. And there's another one <clears throat> with uh, the Prime Minister himself delivering the vaccines because the BMA GPs wouldn't withheld their cooperation. And, and, the, and the shadow uh, cast by those events back in the 1930s uh, very much influences uh, the dynamics today. And we maybe have a chance to discuss some of that. Right, so I think I've covered all of that. So we will just rattle on past that. Um, look, don't worry about the detail here at all. Uh, and sorry about all the words, but I just wanted, this is this one slide to illustrate um, the diversity within our health system in terms of provision of services. The orange line are uh, bars represent DHB employment. The light blue primary health care or primary care, primary health organizations and primary care, and the dark blue private. And if you're seeking some order in this, you will not find it. Uh, it's completely haphazard. So let me just take podiatrists by way of example. They're about a third of, or quarter of the way from the bottom, nearly all in the private for-profit sector. Podiatry, and some of you will know this obviously, is an essential service for people with diabetes. And there are many, many unnecessary lower limb amputations occurring in New Zealand for the want of podiatrists, and particularly amongst Māori and Pacific people. Why we don't provide podiatry services as a part of the standard package of services for people with diabetes is not an explainable question. It simply is a fact that we don't. And we'll find that sort of irrationality uh, in that picture up and down. Um, and I won't spend any more time on this other than to say that uh, our system is a mixed economy, if you like, a provision, private for-profit, private non-profit, and public. 
So it's a complex organizational context in which to carry out a review. And, and just as a reminder, the terms of reference for the review excluded ACC and excluded private, private healthcare provision, but they did include the boundaries between the public system and ACC and the public system and private care. Um, timeline for changes, uh, we've covered all of that, uh, but this one we haven't. <clears throat> so the central architecture of the new system, which we're gonna turn to in just a moment, was, uh, will be established, we are told, and this requires legislative changes uh, by July next year. So that is a very, very challenging pace of change. And uh, Minister Little is determined in his public statements to maintain that pace of change. Um, we could reflect on maybe later the, the concerns in the health system about coping with COVID and it has to be said, a decade of, uh, in my view at least, relative inertia, um, coping with all of that, and also the most profound set of changes there has been for a very, very long time. Uh, nevertheless, uh, my personal view is the minister is correct to keep his foot on the pedal. Um, it's very hard to implement changes. Uh, generally they're best done quickly, or at least aspects of them, them are, are best done quickly We're on the structural side of things. But we can debate that because there will be a, a variety of views on that point. But just to say, a great deal of work is going to happen between now and next July. The boards of two of the new agencies will be announced, I'm told, on Thursday this week. So we'll see if that actually comes to pass. And I'll uh, talk more about those two new agencies in just a moment. They are Health New Zealand and the Māori Health Authority. In terms of problem definition, and these, these, some of these slides, and this one and the previous one, two, two slides, come from the, the so-called transition unit. Uh, the transition unit is a group of people uh, physically situated in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet who are who took the recommendations of the Simpson review and are translating them into the reforms that we see unfolding. The transition unit is, la is largely populated by, and I don't know the number splits, but largely populated by uh, private consultants, mainly from EY, led by Stephen McKernan, who in, in a previous life had been Director General of Health in the in the period roughly 2005 to 2010, and uh, now works for EY as a consultant. He leads that, uh, that unit. Their interpretation of the problem definition is that we have a complicated and fragment, fragmented system, that we have widespread inequity of outcomes, that the system is complex in terms of accountability structures. And, and often accountability is lacking. Um, there is inconsistent planning and commissioning, and there's a low level of financial sustainability. Now, those conclusions are largely lifted out of the Simpson Review Report, and I would concur with all of them. I think they're all true. And we could add to that list very easily with other problems. But I think as a succinct uh, identification of the main problems, that, that does pretty well. I'm now going to turn to the, uh, some of the features of the current changes. And I'm starting with a new central architecture. <clears throat> As of July, 2022 next year, the 20 district health boards will cease to exist. And I was amused that I was appointed as a deputy chair of the Southern District Health Board in the same week that Andrew Little announced its dissolution in one year, <clears throat> especially as I'd partly been the author of the report which prompted that. <clears throat> um, never, uh, nevertheless, uh, they will cease to exist and they will be amalgamated into one new organization, the holding name of which is Health New Zealand. And I think that name will change with time. It was never intended as a permanent name. It was intended as a holding name. 
we will have one national health service, which may end up looking more like the NHS than 20 different district health boards, all semi doing their own thing. And we can talk about the pros and cons of that shift. But that is a profound change. Now I'm going to turn to a slide showing the central architecture. <clears throat> this again is a slide from the uh, transition unit. It says confidential at the top, uh, but I don't think there's anything sensitive or confidential on this slide at all. And I've used versions of the slide many times. <clears throat> the new central architecture will consist of three agencies. One being the Ministry of Health. Okay. But a smaller version of the Ministry of Health. And you see that in the red circle. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, the blue circle at the bottom. There's the Ministry of Health. Uh, on the right is the dark green Māori Health Authority. That is a new agency. On the left is the lighter green health new zealand so those three agencies health new zealand the ministry of health and the maori health authority comprise the key components of of the center of the new new zealand health system that is the new central architecture one existing organization the ministry of health considerably reduced in size and reduced in functions and two new agencies, Health New Zealand and the Māori Health Authority. The functions of the Ministry of Health will be policy. That is the current function, but it will be the main focus. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and also public health, population health. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, we have tried to design a system which is more, more coherent, more joined up in terms of its capacity to respond to public health threats. So there will be a new public health agency located within the Ministry of Health. That's new central architecture. There will be regional, there will be a regional level of organization, and then there will be locality level of organization and locality plans. And that's where the local voice and the local input will need to come in the new system. All right, please do jot down your comments or questions if there's anything confusing about this while we're on our way through. So a unified system under the umbrella of Health New Zealand with a new Māori Health Authority. The Māori Health Authority, which I'll just say a couple of things about now, uh, will have a number of functions and it will also have the right of veto against Health New Zealand. So there is a, a desire on the behalf of the minister that the three central agencies work together well. And if the Māori Health Authority believes its voice is not being sufficiently heeded, the minister did say that it would have the right of veto. We're yet to see that in the legislation, of course. The Māori Health Authority will have a budget and it will be able to commission health services. <coughs> that will... Uh, certainly include Kaupapa Māori services, and it will include a range of other services as well, yet to be clarified. So we, um, I personally don't know the detail on that at all yet. So it's a major new driver uh, of pro-equity change in the system, working alongside Health New Zealand, and together they will be commissioning all the health services that we all are familiar with, plus hopefully a range of new services. Health New Zealand itself will be the, uh, the owner of and manager of and will be accountable for what we currently think of as the 20 district health boards. Our primary care providers will be grouped together in localities and I'll talk more about those right now. <clears throat> localities will consist of natural populations, whatever natural might be in it, be in a local context of let's say between 20 and 100,000 people 
they will consist of formal networks of community-based providers. They will have a population health focus and there will be a defined set of services which should be available to all people as of right. That doesn't mean free, but it means they should be available. By formal network, I think well, well, what we had in mind <clears throat> was that there would be a level of formality uh, of uh, caring for a population by that network of providers uh, with appropriate information sharing with protections, of course, so that high quality services can be provided to that population. So if I had rheumatic heart disease, for example, and I rock up to a dentist that I've not been to before, that dentist should, as a routine, have in their health system, in their information system, knowledge of my health conditions. That's what I mean by formal networks, inf information sharing to the benefit of the population being served. The core of services, um, again, uh, I know what we recommended, but I don't know what the outcome of that will be, but it will include all of the obvious things, maternity care, pharmacy, uh, physiotherapy, uh, general practice, et cetera, et cetera. All the things you would expect to be in that list of the core. <clears throat> uh, um, uh, it will include child and adolescent oral health. I don't expect it to include adult dentistry. Uh, that is a, a tragedy all of its own, uh, which I think uh, re requires a different discussion. Uh, suffice to say at this point that uh, adult or healthcare is a complete mess in New Zealand in terms of uh, inequitable service provision. All right, I think I'll skip over that one. A bit busy, and I'll finish by talking, just making a few final comments about uh, what I referred to as the recommendation of the Waitangi Tribunal. Remember earlier on, and uh, they recommend new treaty principles or treaty principles. So they used to be and have been for a very long time, partnership, protection and participation. And these are the new ones. <clears throat> Don't worry about the words, just the headings there. Tino ranga piritanga, equity, active protection, options and partnership. And I just, as an aside, note that when ministers, it was uh, I think Little and Henare, announced in April these changes, Minister Little referred to wishing to have tino ranga tirutanga expressed within the health system. I suspect that was a first. I've never heard that before, a Minister of the Crown stating that as an aspiration uh, for Māori within our health system. <clears throat> and uh, if you look at the key Ministry of Health documents, they are reflecting the, what the tribunal's principles in them, and that includes tino ranga tirutanga. Equity. Uh, and the wording there says requires the Crown, Crown to commit to equitable health outcomes for Māori. Active protection, the word active has been added in there so that it's not passive, it is active. Option refers to the provision of kapapa Māori services as an option for Māori. And partnership <clears throat> is the one that remains unchanged there. And uh, just to say that partnership is built, is baked into this, the system design through the Māori Health Authority and also to something I'll show you a slide in just a moment, uh, the so-called Iwi Māori Partnership Boards, which will be structured in, uh, in every region in New Zealand and will have co-governance roles at the locality and regional level. So those are the new principles. Um, Okay, I think we're done there. Um, I will just turn to my final reflections. Well, these are all up for discussion, of course, and there will be numerous views on this. <clears throat> my reflection would be that a one size fits all universalism approach has not served the needs of New Zealand, particularly Māori and Pacific and low income populations very well. And uh, sometimes the term tailored universalism is used and I would like to think that's the direction in which we're traveling. An expectation of universal service provision, but tailored to the needs of different populations. My second point there is that 
uh, Te Pākehā, the Pākehā world, in my view, needs to learn how to exercise reciprocity. Uh, I have witnessed for my entire working life, Māori, colleagues, friends, um, seamlessly traversing from one world to the other and back again, often on an hourly basis. And, and the expectation placed on them is that they have the skills to do so. And of course they do, by and large. Pākehā have so seldom reciprocated and learned how to traverse from one world to the other seamlessly. And in my view, we need to, we, Pākehā, I'm speaking for myself here, Te Ao Pākehā needs to reciprocate on that point. And I'm hoping that these new structures might nudge us in that direction. Uh, the strengthening of Te Tiriti or Waitangi, the articles, uh, and also the principles embedded in the new system is a very important change. Uh, Y2575, that's the work of the Waitangi Tribunal around one particular claim, um, has been very, very influential and important. We have one new system, a central architecture of what we might refer to now as a national health service. I think that's hugely significant. We can reflect on that. And we have the Māori Health Authority, which I also believe <coughs> um, has the potential to be a positive disruptor, positive disruptor to drive proactivity change within the system in a way that Pākehā organisations really struggle to do because they default to the needs of the majority all the time. And I'm hoping that the Māori Health Authority can provide some counterbalance to that um, default. And that, I believe, Pat, is me. That is my last slide. And time-wise, it's 12 minutes past six. Well, that's extremely good because I didn't know how you were going to do all this in that time. So I'm very impressed um, about the way that you've made it so clear um, with such big challenges. And it feels in a way that we, I wish we'd had more time to delve into some of them. Um, I, I think... Um, one of the things you raised about um, Andrew Little um, struck home with me. You were asking for some feedback about things to do with his, um, uh, you know, what his approach. Um, I met him a little while ago. I don't see an awful lot of Andrew Little, but um, I did happen to sit beside him and um, got talking about this because I was on a PHO at one time and I was totally blown away with his commitment his enthusiasm, I've never seen a minister with quite such enthusiasm for the portfolio that he had and um, the clarity he had, but I also came away with a really big fear and I, when I hear all of what you've said about the time frame and the need to get this through and the big, big, big fish hooks that are in here in terms of politics. Um, but I, I think it's a wonderfully... Um, necessary um, change and it's got lots of things in it that are just so exciting um, that you know I, I think it's a terrific report and um, one of the things that one of our um, participants gave us a question early about the role of the DHBs and the loss of democracy that was seen to be in that process. And so I wondered if you could start by perhaps addressing that. There are some questions in the chat, which we might come back to, but we will allow people to ask those questions directly if they want. Um, but first of all, if you could just talk about the localities, how they are going to be different from PHOs and um, what have you, but the DHBs themselves, there is this loss of um, people's ability to elect people onto the board and how you see that in terms of that loss of democracy and the centralising of the, the, the um, process. Yeah, thank you, Pat. <clears throat> and thank you to the person who asked that question. I think it is a central issue. Uh, and it's one that uh, I personally find quite complex. I'm a non-elected member of a district health board, and I have I observe close up the effects of that layer of democracy. Uh, I also observe how it plays out across the country and all the district health boards. And I think that in itself is worthy of ref reflection. I don't believe that democracy serves our needs as communities very well in the way that it plays out in district health boards. 
And that's uh, part of the critique that the review panel mounted against district health boards. <clears throat> uh, I think we all believe very, very strongly in, in local voice and, and, the, and the, the principle de principles of democracy being exercised in the health system. <clears throat> but district health boards are hugely complex, very challenging and very high stakes organizations. Um, I'm not convinced that the way to run them is through um, elected boards. That all set, that's just a personal view I have, and it's debatable. Um, the question though, speaks to how will we build local voice into the new system? And I think that's a mission critical question. And I, um, at the moment, there is insufficient information to convince me that we're gonna get that right. But I, I live in, I mean, I'm reasonably confident that the work will be done. It is so, so important. And that a lot of it will center around the localities and how they're structured and governed and the voices, the, the giving of voice of communities at the locality level. And then in one sense, that's structured in with the Iwi Māori partnership boards, but, but Communities, of course, are diverse and complex, and we need multiple voices uh, expressed at the local level. So for me, that's very much a wait and see how that plays out. But I think it's utterly crucial. Uh, we are moving to a much more centrally controlled system, and there have to be counterbalances in there, very strong local voices, where local communities, and sometimes that means very local, very small communities, need to be able to express their needs, their views, into the health system in a way that those are heard. So it is a crucial issue. Mm. Okay, I'll, I'll, um, I could talk to you a long time on that one, but um, I think we'll move on. What I wanted to do just now is say to people, you're very welcome to ask questions now. I'd like people to um, follow this following protocol. Um, everybody's on mute at the moment, but if you signal at the bottom of your screen, you'll see um, reactions on the panel, uh, on the, the little panel at the bottom. And if you click on that, there's a little thumbs up or a wave of your hand, I think it is. It, if you want to speak, you just click on one of those. Um, we'll then unmute you. And then we would like you to keep your um, questions succinct. And remember that lots of people may want to ask questions, so everybody should have a chance. And please continue to feel free to use the chat function because we'll go there if there are no questions. There are some, um, well, there are some questions. There's one very long comment I um, see from someone on here, um, from Andre, I think, but otherwise there are some questions on the side. So if anybody wants to speak, now is the time to do it, okay? And um, in the meantime, we have a couple of questions. Um, one from John Ryle says, where do disability support services currently run out of the MOH fit into the structure? So, um, yeah, we, we yeah, great, great question, John, and thank you. And I, I haven't used the word disability at all. Um, I'll, I'll try and be brief. I think that was the weakest part of the review, the disability component, John. And, um, uh, there's a variety of reasons for that, partly the, the, the sheer magnitude of the task that we were confronted with. Um, but, but nevertheless, I think it was undercooked. And I'm not sure how that's going to play out in the new system. There's very little I can say or in, in answer to your question. Uh, we did address disability and disability services and the, the nature of that system. But as I say, I think it was slightly undercooked uh, it required more time more effort more resource to go into that okay thank you boyd swinburne um kia ora thanks peter fantastic um presentation congratulations to you and um in the work that you've done on this but actually i think even bigger congratulations to andrew little to go far beyond what you said or even the um the, the maori committee and and taking it getting a really revolutionary potential in our health system. Um, Peter, in the report, um, you quite rightly pointed out that, um, you know, 80 to 90% of our health statistics 
are determined by factors outside the healthcare system. Um, and there has been attempts uh, internationally to try to get um, the health system to influence those other wider determinants, the commercial determinants around um, alcohol and tobacco and junk food and things, but also transport and uh, income and so on. There's, a, there's so many things happening within government um, and in society. Where is the, where is the, in the system, is there that component that is going to deal with the 80 to 90% and try to influence that part of our health status? Yeah, thanks, Boyd. Uh, uh, Marvellous question. Um, so I'll try and describe the, the formal components of the system as it is unfolding uh, that will have the responsibility for addressing uh, the determinants of health and in particular referred to the commercial determinants of health, I think. Uh, noting that just in the last few weeks, the 20 district health boards have combined to release a statement on alcohol. And I don't think that has occurred before on any commercial determinant board. I might be wrong on that point, but they've made a very strong joint statement. After 20 years of existence, the 20 district health boards have uh, at last started to exercise some muscle yeah. on that issue. Uh, anyway, that's an aside. So my understanding of the public health uh, stroke population health uh, system that is being designed now, <clears throat> it will consist of uh, a component within the Ministry of Health called the Public Health Agency. I haven't seen terms of reference for that, so I can't comment. I could guess, but uh, I, I will withhold any speculation because it's. I think it's really got to be described unless you've seen it described. Health New Zealand will have the operational arm and the currently 12 regional public health units will be a coherent uh, set of services reporting into Health New Zealand. So there will be unified structure there um, and, and, and one would hope that with the capacity to expand itself over time, but in a coherent nationally coordinated way. The other big hope I think for the, for the future Boyd, <clears throat> and certainly my hope, and, and, and it's a speculative one, uh, and I referred to the positive disruptor <laughs> element of this, and that is the Māori Health Authority. Yeah. So do they, do they have a specific by... mandate to do that, to, to, to comment on determinants of health and, and influence well, policy? I think by its nature, it is a public health organisation. Yeah. And it, the determinants <clears throat> of health are central to its interests. They have to be. And uh, I think over the years, we've seen very focused and, uh, and uh, sometimes courageous leadership from out of uh, from Maori leaders on commercial determinants, so <clears throat> that's a partial answer to your question. Uh, but let, but 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 just to say also, um, uh, picking up on that experience that we've just had of the twenty district health boards working in unison on one issue, there is, as you said in your, in your question, there is so much to be gained by leveraging off the power of an employer. Health New Zealand will have roughly a $20 billion budget. Mm -hmm. It'll have somewhere between 74 and 80,000 employees. It's simply the biggest organization in New Zealand, it will be. Uh, it will have leverage. And I'm hoping that it, it uh, and it will have a um, health promotion unit within it, what we currently call the um, uh, Hearing a Holder, the health promotion agency will be embedded within it. So I'm hoping there's real potential in all these central organisations, plus the, the more local, uh, locally based system of public health units. Boyd. Thanks, Peter. OK, thank you. Dr Elizabeth Kerikeri. Oh, kia ora, Peter. Thank you for um, this presentation. I've really enjoyed it. I'm one of the Green Party MPs and um, I'm one of, and the health spokesperson for the Greens. I was interested in... That, as I said in the chat, but uh, when we were in the Health Select Committee one time, the minister was speaking to us and, and they talked to us about localities. 
I suggested that could rainbow people be a locality? So a locality is geographic, I understand, um, but does it need to be a really localized one or could it be a national one of a certain community? And what, yeah, I wondered what you thought about that and if during the course of your work, when you're looking at some of the marginalized communities, uh, did rainbow uh, people, particularly trans, intersex, non-binary people, uh, come up in those conversations? Uh, Kora Elizabeth, uh, great question, thank you. I can only refer to the soft signals I hear coming out of the system. And I think the answer is yes, but, but don't hold me accountable to that. <laughs> I, I'm Peter not... told me. <laughs> well, look, I hope the answer is yes, because I think there are a number of communities one could easily think of uh, where there is, I mean, the term I used was natural communities. And I would see the rainbow community as a natural community of interest, particularly in, in a metropolitan area such as uh, Tamaki Makado, where there would be certainly a critical mass of people to form, I would have thought, a natural locality there. Uh, and possibly with virtual services, one could think of national services for some communities. So th that's the best I can do on that. Um, my information is not probably not any better than yours on that one. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Grace Southern. <clears throat> yes, um, I'm interested in the, the uh, management of professionals. Uh, higher, uh, unitary hierarchies um, are distinctly unsuitable suited to handle, to manage professionals and particularly diverse range of professionals you've got. And I'm just wondering how what you see is the role of uh, the professional organizations and how to maximize role, that role. Have you, what thought have you done into really what is the uh, best way, optimal way to handle um, professionals? And what do you see a role for universities in uh, accountability? Uh, thank you, Greg. Um, oh, man, I mean, you've opened up a whole universe of interesting issues there, because I haven't mentioned, amongst all the things I haven't mentioned, is, is uh, health workforces included in that. And, uh, and I think that's what you're alluding to here. Uh, so the health system is a people system. It's centered around people caring for other people. And of course, infrastructure is required naturally but in the end it's a people intensive set of services and it's a highly professionalized as you said gray group of uh, um, system and while i have focused in my comments on structural changes there's no doubt in my mind that culture and leadership are generally more important than structures. I'm not being nihilistic about structures at all, because structures matter a great deal, and they can impede or um, facilitate positive outcomes. But culture and leadership uh, are untrumpable in their importance in running health systems. Some uh, a terminology which is sometimes used in reference, well, actually comes out of other sciences, but it's used in reference to the health system as complex adaptive system. And that refers to the uh, unpredictability of the behavior of the health system. So you poke or prod or change one bit, and a set of responses or changes or adaptations occur elsewhere in the system, which one had never th thought of. That is the nature of a complex adaptive system. And part of that complex adaptive system, that, that characteristic of our system, derives from the multiplicity of professional voices and interests operating in the system. <clears throat> For most professions, we run a high trust model, whereby accountability structures are looser, trust is higher, and professions are supposed to self-govern and maintain standards and drive quality 
on their own account. Different societies approach that in somewhat different ways. And, uh, and in New Zealand, we see uh, hybrid versions of what I've just said occurring all over the place, particularly around commercial models where contracts are tighter, accountabilities are tighter, and uh, professional autonomy is more circumscribed. My view in running health systems is that we need to have, uh, it's necessary for us to run high trust models a lot of the time. It is necessary for us to have strong clinical governance to use that jargon within the health system. It is also necessary for us to be acutely aware of and sensitive to commercial incentives and drivers, which are in our system and in other systems, but particularly in our system, are insufficiently taken account of often when we're trying to design systems which serve the needs of populations. Gray, I could go on forever on this topic, so I think I'll just pause there. I don't know if I've answered your question or not. No, right to you. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think that question is um, one I can think of loads of other. Going back to the one before about the community, um, the localities, um, it, it sort of impinges on there as well. The professionalism that um, drives the system um, is often very difficult for communities to engage with. And, you know, the way that you're talking about, because... And I'm thinking at the moment of the, the example of community councils with um, local government, where they're all collapsing in, in many places um, because, because it's just so hard for them to get noticed in our professional system. So I think that there are huge, huge challenges in trying to develop what are, you know, very informal sounding um, locality systems. So it will be interesting to see what the proposals are. Anyway, next person, um, Neil. Um, would you like to? Thank you. Um, Peter, Neil Woodham's here. Um, and uh, have, you, just... have you got your video on or are you not wanting to have it on? Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, if you could put your video on down in the bottom corner. How's that? Oh, that's better, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> Peter and I are very familiar because um, we've been working on some work uh, that emanates from the tribunal's hearings. And Peter, you haven't met, mentioned the superior report, but there would be people on this um, on, on this broadcast that would be very interested in it. And you may want to just cover some of the, uh, the key points. The one thing I would say, I've been involved with the original uh, treaty claim Y1315 since 2005. And there are aspects of the reforms that we're delighted with because we highlighted that far back that um, a, we called it a Maori DHB in our claim, but the essential uh, format of that was uh, that Maori needed to control the resources to be able to make the changes that were necessary to provide equitable health outcomes. And so that's great. I'd have to say that um, the performance of the ministry since the tribunal's uh, decision from a claimant's point of view is very disappointing uh, and may well give rise to further claims in that they haven't lived up to the uh, undertakings that they've given. And one of the key things around the structure from the claimant's point of view was that they wanted the Maori Health Authority to report not through the ministry because there's very little trust in the ministry. Um, I think that's my, my personal interpretation of it. And they wanted the Maori Health Authority to report directly to the minister. But you may want to comment on that. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Um, gosh, uh, indeed. And, and what a fascinating process that's been. So you referred to the Sapere report. Sapere is a health system consultancy. <clears throat> um, and, and a very long story, very short. Uh, claimants to the Waitangi Tribunal challenged the failure of the 2001 health reforms under Minister Annette King to deliver on the very clear promises that Minister King and others made around health equity. To my mind, 
in my personal view, that the legislation that she enacted and the intent was fine legislation and fine policy work too. Uh, it failed poorly, it failed badly in the implementation. And that was the base, well, at least part of the basis for a claim to the Waitangi Tribunal. One of the recommendations of the tribunal was that the claimant should work with the Crown to agree on a methodology for uh, determining the degree of compensation to Māori primary health organisations because of policy failure. And that's where Spurry come in. They did that piece of work under the guidance of um, the claimants and an expert group that Neil chaired. And uh, it's, it's a, in my mind, a, an innovative piece of work. And what it does is highlight the costs of policy failure. And, and this is a very poignant moment in time to be having this discussion. Because again, major promises have been made to Māori and others around health equity. And what the Saberi report does is point out the massive human and economic cost of policy failure in this domain. And, the, and they've uh, put, dollar equivalent values on that failure. And it's, the, the numbers are eye-wateringly big, but of course the numbers are only a way of expressing the pain and human suffering and needless loss in this context in Māori communities that have resulted from poor policy implementation. So that's the Sapere report. It's in the public domain. And if anybody, anybody wants to flick me an email afterwards, I'm very happy to share that document and something else I've written about that. So a couple of things I've written about it, actually, if anybody's curious. But the document itself speaks for itself. It's just um, somewhat more complex to read. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Um, I'll just go down some of the, the chat questions that we've had. Um, We've had one, there are a couple of questions about um, ACC connections, about um, are there any new links with ACC or strengthened relationship? Now, you may have answered that in, the, um, in your talk because I think you said it didn't touch on ACC, um, but someone else was keen to know about any connections between ACC and also the disability support services with the report. So do you have any comments on that? Well, yeah, thank you. Again, very, very good questions. So ACC itself was not in our terms of reference. We were not reviewing ACC or its functions. It's a social security mechanism, uh, a social insurance mechanism, uh, which many would deem to be working well. However, from the panel's point of view, the boundary between ACC and what we think of as the health system uh, raises major equity issues around that boundary. If I break my femur by getting run over by a cyclist when I step out of my office after this meeting, I will be whipped off to hospital. I'll have ACC-based treatment. I'll have ACC-based rehabilitation, et cetera, et cetera. If I fall over because of a fractured nephew femur as I walk out of my office, none of what I've just said applies. Um, I will get services, of course, through the public system, but it will be a different sort of service. So that is the equity issue that, that is apparent in our system. And it's unresolved at this point. Uh, we as a panel did not resolve that problem and I don't see the current restructurings resolving that problem either. That's my answer to that question. And, and disability support services, I think watch the space. I, I don't know where that's going to land. Uh, and as I say, I think it's, it's been undercooked. Uh, we had lengthy discussions about the structural location of disability within the health system or elsewhere, standalone, outside the health system. And again, we found that very, very hard to resolve. And in the absence of what we thought might be a, a defensible position one way or the other, we did not come to a landing point on that. Um, and I'll, I'll just leave my comments at that. I think that's, uh, it's a, there's a whole, again, a whole universe of really, really important discussions to be had there. Somebody did ask if there were any disabled people on the review team. Uh, the answer is yes. Yes, there were. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll go to Eileen Brown now. Um... Great, Jane. 
you're on. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah. Um, appreciate your uh, comments, Peter, and the presentation. Great. Uh, this real opportunity for the legislation to be inspiring and principled based. Uh, what and in some of the conversations that people have had tonight about expecting it to be um, principle based in respect of engagement and participation, do you think that is the feature of? Uh, I mean, I'm asking you to look into a glass ball, but or um, you know, see something that you may not be able to comment on. But is that the nature of the legislation that you would expect to see? Well, I, that's a really interesting question, Eileen. I am aware that New Zealand is capable of inspiring legislation. Uh, and I, I'm sure some people will disagree with this, but um, for example, and I might get my name slightly wrong here, but I think it's called the Māori Language Act of 2016. Uh, and someone correct me if I've got the wrong name in the wrong year. Anyway, it's a recent piece of legislation uh, written in the Reo Māori, written in English, principles-based, and very strong. And I would hazard a guess that there is no equivalent piece of legislation anywhere else in the world. Now, I think it's a step in the direction, and only a step. But it's a, I think it does reflect on the, the ability of uh, Aotearoa to come up with some pretty inspiring legislation. Like others on this call, I see Andrew Little as a person who is very motivated around a uh, principles-based approach to running a public health system. <clears throat> and I, I think our ch the chances of having something which is principles-based and inspiring are better now than, you know, if you think back over the broad sweep of the last three, four, five decades, better now than probably they ever have been. So let's, let's hope, Eileen... <laughs> Okay, um, I'll go back to, there's a question here, quite confrontational. How do these neoliberal reforms address increasing demand, decreasing resources and the medical monopolies of the medical councils? Yeah, look, thank you. Um, look, I've got huge sympathy for that question. I'm not sure I would brand the reforms as neoliberal, but our context is very strongly neoliberal. And, and by that, I mean that we live in a world where there is a uh, assumptions of uh, intergenerational inequity, assumptions of relatively low tax, of relatively non-progressive tax rates, um, and I could go on, uh, assumptions of <clears throat> smaller rather than larger governments. That's what I refer to as the neoliberal context. <clears throat> I, I think the major elephant in the room here is we as a society, we as a generation are not forward paying. Uh, we're not, we are not extracting from our system of society those things that we say that we want. <clears throat> we have allowed wealth and privilege to be captured in too small a group of people in our society. And these reforms in themselves don't address those issues at all. They don't even touch on them. All they do is restate our aspirations, if that's the way you wish to put it. That's my view. Um, on, on the power of the medical profession, yes. Um, I mean, I, again, again, that divides, invites such a big discussion. Uh, power, hierarchy, wealth, privilege, yes. Uh, and uh, we've talked about accountability. And that's as close as to that discussion as I, I, I think we'll get in, in this evening. Uh, having clarity of accountability and the levers to get what we wish uh, out of the system and to be working effectively with our health professionals rather than ineffectively with them uh, is a hope. It's, it's my hope. But, but uh, gosh, that relies on culture and leadership so much. I will ask one thing um, on the back of that question. Do you see any change in the approach of the doctors to the whole question about um, employment within the system or, um, or uh, 
continuing to be independent business um, contractors in the system. Do you think there's any prospect for changing that? Well, I see changes happening in every possible direction. <clears throat> so um, traditional practice, general practice is still dominant, but there is a multiplicity of other organizational forms now, some of which just simply didn't exist in the not too distant past. Uh, and, and what I'm referring to there is the corporatization of primary health care. We're having larger, larger and larger organizations taking over big chunks of primary care infrastructure and applying a, uh, at the risk of oversimplifying it, a, a, a high volume, low cost model, which do actually meet the needs of some communities, but in a particular way and with a particular model of care, which many would say doesn't necessarily result in high quality care. But that in itself is a complex conversation because one might say some service is better than no service. Mm -hmm. um, and we remember, we put financial barriers to access in the way of care at the front door of the system uh, in uh, general practice and in, in, in adult mm -hmm. uh, oral health care, of course. Mm, thank you. Peter, Glensor. Uh, kia ora, um, Pat. Uh, kia ora, Peter, and thank you, as always, for a very, very um, articulate and helpful and clear analysis. My question is about the implementation of the reforms and the, one of the earlier slides where you spoke about the general lack of money that's available for the system as a whole. I can't remember what the combined deficit of the district health boards is, but it's from memory over $100 million. It may be even more than that, that they are spending more than they are currently being given. What's your sense of how the government is going to be able to both increase the quantum of money that the system needs and increase the amount of money that will be needed to move to a more equitable system. Because with all the, no matter what people say, we, I doubt if the government is gonna be willing to take money away from areas in order to make it available to others, which means that all the change has to be by addition. But there is this huge pressure just to get the system back um, uh, on a level um, uh, basis, uh, and then to be pumping money into um, Maori health, Pacifica health, mental health, all those underfunded systems that are the source of the inequity. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora, Peter, and lovely to see you. Um, I think your question actually links back to that last question about neoliberalism to some extent. And I notice in the UK, Right now, Boris Johnson is making some what might think of uh, one might think of as counterintuitive for his Conservative government decisions about funding the National Health Service and increasing tax rates to do that. <clears throat> um, yes, in my view, our system has run too lean for maybe around a decade, and one might say it was running way too lean before that too. Uh, the, I think the long run history is that these there are corrections and the corrections go along the, the, the political cycle. Uh, so national tend to, to hold expenditure more, labor tend to do the correction <clears throat> upwards. But all of this is within parameters of what, uh, what is deemed to be acceptable for vote health in the context of total government expenditure. Do we spend enough on health? It's ultimately a decision that has to be made by the electorate and, and we vote governments in and out accordingly. My view is that the problems you've outlined are immense. <clears throat> and uh, I doubt whether there will be uh, a large amount of new money slopping around in the system. Well, I wouldn't even say slopping around, new money in the system to facilitate the very considerable changes that we're, that we're attempting to make. And, and that is a worry, but it is also our reality. It's the reality of our small country. 
uh, and, and the nature of the governments that we've elected and, and the political philosophies which have prevailed now for 40, 50 years. I'm not sure if that's an adequate answer to your question, Peter. Okay. Shanti Amaratunga. Um, actually, um, Pat, I've just noticed Laurie Magnus kept having her hand up several times. I wonder. And she's... Pardon? Is Laurie wanted to speak because she had her hand I up have, several times? I have, I have no, I can't see anybody else's hand up except yours. Oh. Okay, that's fine. I go ahead. I thought Laurie had a hand up before. Um, um, thank you very much, Kira, uh, Peter, for the very clear and uh, open way in which you discuss these issues. I my question really relates to the plurality and diversity of voices that we need to hear from out in the community and uh, understand. I think um, the question that came before from uh, the Green Party member was tap tapping into this. Where do you see the opportunities? Um, for people's voices to be heard when we are we have dismantled the, the DHB elected process. How will we enable people to have a seat at the table at appropriate times and be heard? Do you see those accountabilities to the widest communities working out in ways that can serve the folks at the margins? Yeah, thanks, Shanti. Um... Well, let me just say again, I don't see, if we take the rainbow community as an example, I would say it's very haphazard about whether their interests are in, uh, represented properly in the current structures. Very haphazard. They may well be in some areas and, and probably not in others. Um, so it's not like the system's humming along very well at the moment in that regard. Uh, and, and, and in that regard, I mean, in listening to, seeking out, actively seeking out, proactively seeking out, listening to and heeding the voices of communities who struggle to have their health uh, healthcare needs met within the current system. It's a problem now. And I think it's the vulnerability of the design of the new system. And I say vulnerability because we've yet to see whether that vulnerability, how well it's addressed in the design. My sense is that it has to be addressed at the locality level to make sense. Um, but, but in saying that, an organization like the Māori Health Authority will also have its ears open to the needs of iwi and, and also probably to smaller communities so that there will be other avenues in to influence the system. But I think your question is the right one. And uh, it's a question we need to carry on asking because when we centralize the system, which um, remember the panel actually didn't do that. We recommended eight to 12 district health boards, not 20. Um, Minister Little said there will be no district health boards in one central system. And I can see the strength in what he's suggesting, <clears throat> but it, it takes away uh, that element of local accountability uh, that district health boards do exercise and places a reliance on the central system having regional and locality-based structures that are robust enough to reflect those interests. So I, I would say, Shanti, let's all of us keep our eye on that one and, and exercise our voice in trying to influence um, the system uh, as it's developing and when it is developed so that it's really strong in terms of being able to channel local voices and those local include those communities that Elizabeth referred to, for example, the Rainbow community. Thank you. Um, Kathy Torpy, um, would you like to switch on your video? Not looking the best right now, but there you That's go. That's all right. <laughs> Listen, I just wanted to say that, you know, as I'm listening to this and I, and I thoroughly believe in equity and, um, I spent a lot of years as a patient and a psychologist traveling around the world speaking to health conferences about relationship-centered care. Um, and it is essential, the relationship, not only the relationship of the clinician and the patient, but the relationship of the whole system to the patient um, and, and to the providers. Now, my concern is that in this conversation, I keep hearing about accountability and equity, which are important, but I'm not hearing anything about, um, about 
patient responsibility, and I'm speaking now as a patient about that, that you can't, you can't measure the equity of patient outcome without looking at the patients, whoever they are, participation and accountability in their own health care, in prevention and in their care when they get ill. And, and I'm not hearing that. I'm hearing a political conversation, but I'm not hearing about, hang on a second, equity means that we're all in it together and we all have responsibility. And because of that, we all should have equitable outcomes. Okay, can you help me with that? Yeah, um, no, thanks, Kathy. Um, I think inequity means avoidable health outcomes, which are unfair. And, and it resonates very strongly with communities who experience those avoidable health outcomes, which are unfair. And a lot of that is about the big slow moving forces which determine health outcomes such as employment, unemployment, structures of education, mm -hmm. uh, language acquisition, the real Māori, and I could go on and on and on, but we all know what those factors are. Yeah. Um, the system itself drives inequitable health outcomes because uh, of what has become popular in Te Ao Pākehā, the, the, the language of um, unconscious bias. I love that. It means racism <coughs> or misogyny <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. whatever. Anyway, it's, it's polite now to call it unconscious bias. And there's a lot of evidence on this. The, and, and, and generally people within the system are intrigued by that. They hate it and they don't want to be enacting out outcomes in that way. So generally speaking, they engage in those conversations very willingly. Anyway, to come to your point, <clears throat> uh, there is under development, and I'm trying to remember the right words here, a, for, for consultation, a code of consumer and whanau expectations. I think I might have the word slightly wrong there. Nevertheless, it speaks directly to your point. And that is a code of expectations, <clears throat> which will, when, once it's been consulted on very widely and, and finalized, will uh, clarify the obligations of the system to involve patients and whānau in decision-making and a voice in their own journey through the health system. And in doing it, in preventing it, with education and preventing it, that's, that's what I'm talking about. There was a time when there was a big conversation in healthcare about preventative care and focusing on preventing illness rather than putting so many people in the system, to, you know, and then inequitable outcomes. But um, there's a responsibility of all of us. I'm, I'm yeah, sorry, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to have to call it to halt in a minute. So can you just finish on that one? Yeah, but Peter, you finish. I was just going to say, I think to some extent that speaks to the board's question, which is about the commercial determinants of health. Um, you know, I see that the city of Dunedin, the city, and also the university, really struggling with the rules which determine the supply side of alcohol, and unable to uh, affect proper change on that regard. That That is not in the gift of the university, uh, of Otago, I'm talking about in Dunedin, or the DCC actually, to, to, to exercise influence they wish to, to exercise. Um, so that, that's what we call a determinant, a commercial determinant of health. There are, there are commercial forces at work there which determine uh, so many of the health outcomes we see around us, which I think speaks to your point. And the system simply must have a focus on those. And, and that was the, the point Boyd was uh, talking to when he asked his question. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to everyone for all those questions and especially thank you very much to you, Peter, for that very, very good presentation and a very interesting discussion. And I think, I hope at some point as we go through all the changes that continue on that we'll get you back because there were so many big questions in here tonight that we could have talked a great deal more on and it would be quite good to narrow it down to some parts of this and have some more discussion in the future so I hope you'll be willing to do that for us at some future time. Um, I just finished by somebody putting a wee um, chat or oh, Eileen Brown put in um, 
that she enjoyed your response and she said she wished that you were involved in writing the legislation. <laughs> so I guess that uh, that's a uh, high praise. <laughs> so um, thank you very much for tonight. Um, I'd like to say thank you to everybody on the chat, um, on the um, call, and um, I hope we'll see you again sometime soon to talk about health. Um, I'll finish off with a little tarakia, um, unuhia, unuhia, Te pau, te pau, kia watea, kia watea, aira, kua watea, tuturu, whaka, wa, whaka mawa, sorry, kia tina, tina, huie, taiki e. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Pat.